Hello class, and welcome to the first of a few, at the very least, mini lectures that I will be recording over the next few weeks on the topics that we were scheduled to cover through the remainder of the semester. This is obviously not going to be an exact replication of the experience that we would have in class. I'm certainly not going to lecture for an hour and 15 minutes straight. Often these mini lectures will be 15 minutes in length, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but certainly never more than 20 minutes. I want to make sure this is something that is digestible for you and that we really just hit the main one or two ideas that I want to reinforce for this particular section. And so I hope uh, this is going to be one of the ways in which we interact for the remainder of the semester. And you can quiz yourself as to whether or not I might be hiding a young Harry Potter behind me in the very small door that you see over my left shoulder. Um, that said, for those of you who are Harry Potter fans, I hope you enjoyed that little joke. Uh, for those of you who are not, I'm sorry. But uh, we will continue on with regional security today, which I think is quite relevant. We're gonna talk a little bit about it generally, but we'll also talk about it as it relates to the current uh, crisis taking place with the COVID pandemic. So with regards to regional security, as I say here, this is really where idealism meets practicality. There's the idea of what regional security should be able to do, and then there's the reality of what often happens when you put various member states in an organization and put it under pressure. That's one thing that I think is important to understand before we really get into the nitty gritty of this, is that when you put pressure on these organizations during a time of crisis, during a time of security crisis, health crisis, economic crisis, that's where you start to see these organizations splinter a little bit. And you start to see perhaps the rampant individualism uh, that we'll kind of get into a little bit, start to take hold. So let's start with what are some of the positives and what are some of the real importance of regional alliances. One of them is that it brings together a much more cohesive group of countries and member states than something like the United Nations or something like the World Bank or the IMF or uh, you know, the various organizations within the UN in which you have hundreds, you know, close to 200 now, uh, but certainly well over 180 member states coming together, trying to interact with each other from different areas, having different interests, having different priorities, having different identities, and having those discussions and trying to come to a resolution that may work for one part of the world but not for another. That's very challenging. Regional organizations like the United, uh, like the European Union, I should say, like NATO, like ASEAN, uh, like OAS, like the League of Arab States, these are like African, uh, the African Union. These are organizations that bring together a slightly more cohesive group of countries. Often it's grouped uh, geographically, uh, but that often overlays commonalities of religion, commonalities of race, ethnicity, uh, and you also get a little bit more commonality with regards to GDP, although we'll, we'll see some discrepancies there in an example later, but you tend to get countries that are approaching issues from the same point of view. Uh, when you get the European Union together, they're going to look at things the way the, Europe's, the European countries look at them. Okay, uh, and it's a little bit more cohesive than trying to get European countries, Asian countries, African countries, Middle Eastern countries, South American countries to all agree on a common solution. That could be quite difficult, obviously. So you're getting a more culturally and politically homogenous group of countries together. This is uh, obviously would be a beneficial thing to getting work done. Uh, these countries are gonna have common security interests because they have that geographic proximity to each other. They are roughly the same level of country, again, going back to GDP uh, and where they might see themselves in the larger world. So they're going to be under the same security constraints. 
And additionally, there's a little bit more of a more tranquil domestic politics uh, between countries here, because often when you have these regional alliances, one of the real benefits is that you tend to have pretty good border security among those regional alliances. Okay, so within them, the countries that are inside of those regional alliances tend to have good border security with the other members. And therefore, you're not getting this tension of, um, of kind of transient populations. You're not getting that same tension of uh, crisis that is spilling over, refugee crisis that's spilling over uh, into other countries, putting an economic strain, a cultural strain on, uh, on other countries in the region. So bring it together, like I said, that very homogenous group of countries. Now, the, the downside to this or a problem that we have is something that is uh, talked about in a really great book. And uh, for those of you who are going on to graduate school, I'm sure that you will likely get uh, assigned this book, particularly if you're trying to go into the NGO world uh, or if you're doing anything with organizations. But it's called Mankers Olson's Logic of Collective Action. Logic of Collective Action is a great book. Uh, and what Olson does in the book is basically outlines a problem that he refers to as a free rider problem. And it says when the incentives of an organization, he's talking here about democracy, but you could apply it to international organizations just as well. It's the idea of when you take incentives to an organization, and you distribute those incentives broadly to everyone, and evenly to everyone, then there are going to be several, what he refers to as quote unquote free riders, uh, who will take advantage of the fact that the incentives are distributed evenly, and they themselves will not participate or will not put forth the resources necessary to achieve the common good. All right, now what does that look like in real life? Well, an example that I can give you uh, domestically might be something along the lines of the environment. So let's say that the Sierra Club, which is an environmental organization uh, in the, based here in the United States, is lobbying Congress for a, a clean air uh, bill. Okay, it wants uh, to reduce carbon pollution, wants to reduce carbon footprint, all right? So they are lobbying Congress. Now let's say that myself, and maybe a few of you, uh, decide to give a few bucks out of our finite resources to help the Sierra Club. Maybe we sign a petition, or maybe we donate $20, $30, $40 to the organization. Okay. Well, lo and behold, a couple months later, the Sierra Club is successful at lobbying Congress to pass a new Clean Air Act that reduces the amount of pollution in the air in the United States. Well, this is an incentive that is broadly distributed to everyone, right? It's not as if because I gave money to the club, I get to breathe cleaner air than anybody else does. So in that case, why would any of you have the incentive of giving money, particularly you know, at a finite level? You know, the idea of, well, is my $20 really going to make or break the success of this organization? Probably not. But I'm going to reap the benefits if this organization is successful. We see the same logic taking place at the state level. So it's not just individuals who act like this, but states act like this too. And so collective action can be very much so challenged when incentives are also unevenly distributed. In other words, when certain countries are getting many more resources, even though everybody's putting the same amount of resources into the pot, if the pot itself is getting distributed in an unequal fashion based upon need, then you can also start to see that pushback of people saying, well, listen, I'm putting in X amount of resources, and it seems like this other country is getting a lot more of these resources than we are. Okay, you can start to see how this is applicable to the current COVID crisis. We'll talk through that a little bit more detail in a second. But one of the things that I want to spend the next couple of slides looking at is the way in which the expansion of the European Union and NATO has really put pressure on collective action. 
So this looks very quickly at the expansion of the European Union over the last you know, half century plus, okay? From a very small organization, that kind of Schengen zone, uh, that initial iron producing European state area in really kind of uh, Western, Northern uh, Europe. And you start to see this gradual expansion into Central and now even Eastern uh, Europe, into Scandinavia, et cetera. And you still have obviously several member states there are, or several states that are trying to become members. So that has put an additional burden on the cultural similarity, right? We said one of the positives of these regional organizations is that you bring together much more homogenous countries. Well, suddenly this doesn't look so homogenous anymore. The fact that you have the Swedes and the Estonians and the Italians and the Spanish and the German and the, you know, the Romanians, that, that becomes a very, very diverse group of national interests to represent. And so something that was a positive, this cohesion, suddenly becomes a bit of a negative. Additionally, you can see this expansion a little bit uh, more clearly and also in, in much the same way in terms of from a Western out to the Eastern side of Europe. But you see this expansion of NATO as well that enlargement of NATO and how that has also really diversified the member state population. And that has also created different security dilemmas. The security dilemmas of those countries on the far eastern front, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Bulgaria, those security crises are a little bit different than those of Portugal and Spain and the United Kingdom due to its proximity to Russia. Even though the NATO was created to combat the Soviet Union, and obviously the Soviet Union is no longer, but you still have a different set of security issues in that Eastern Bloc countries than you do in your traditional Western European countries. It creates even more tension. So an example of this collective action problem in real time, and the, maybe the best example of it is in NATO, where member states are supposed to be contributing a certain amount of their GDP to their defense budget. And it's basically they have to, there's a slightly more complex calculation than I'm, what I'm going to tell you, but basically it boils down to you're supposed to be contributing or allocating 2% of your domestic budget, 2% of your GDP in your domestic budget to the military. So let's say that one more time. So you take your overall GDP, 2% of that should be allocated in your domestic budget, okay, uh, towards defense. The reality is that very few NATO member states actually do that. We in the United States are one of the few. As you'll see in a second, we contribute significantly more than 2%. Um, but because we in the United States do, and the United Kingdom does as well, it allows smaller countries or countries that may not have as large of a military to make the choice of not allocating that much money to defense, and instead they allocate money to social programs. This is one of the areas where when President Trump came into office, he talked about how NATO was a bad deal for the United States. And that got a lot of pushback, understandably so. I, mean, I think many things with President Trump, he may not articulate them in the way that we're used to hearing presidents talk about them, but he did touch on a relevant topic that you actually saw a lot of people, both liberal and conservative, unite behind. And that's basically saying, yeah, the United States is kind of paying NATO's bill in a lot of these ideas, that we are contributing far more in our defense budget uh, to the military and for the purpose of NATO, and that allows smaller countries, and not even small countries, as you'll see in a second, countries like France, uh, countries like Sweden, countries like Poland, to invest far less in their military, and therefore they can allocate money to social programs. And that might then uh, not allow the United States to allocate quite as much in those areas. That's what we're starting to see right now with some of the budget. Uh, issues that we're confronting in a way that some of the European countries are not. So in 2014, everybody agreed to increase their military expenditures to 2% of GDP. 
Only five of the 28 member states have actually accomplished that. Most have decided to push back the goal to the year 2030, actually. So it's still another 10 years until they're planning to get up to that 2% level. And so this is a major issue. And so just to show you what that looks like in real time, this is the military expenditures of the top member states in NATO. And what you'll see here is out of these top contributing member states, only two of them have actually reached that 2% GDP threshold. I know I said five of the 28 earlier. The other three are actually much smaller countries. I actually do think Estonia is one of them. Um, I can't be sure about the other two. But it, the, the smaller member states are the ones who are able to get to that 2% uh, threshold a little bit more easily. But you'll see the United States and the United Kingdom make up a bulk of this uh, allocation of expenditure to the military as a way of protecting this regional alliance. So this is a very problematic issue that we're facing right now. Uh, and this is why President Trump says NATO is a raw deal, because we're putting in 3.57% of our GDP towards the military, uh, and Spain is putting in less than 1%. So that's a problem. That's a really big problem. So looking at this issue moving forward out of, out of Europe, I wanted to use an example from Africa, the Economic uh, Community of Western African States, ECOWAS, uh, is largely an economic and uh, cooperative and alliance, very similar to ASEAN, um, but obviously located here in Western Africa in a slightly smaller amount of countries. Um, but they also serve a peacekeeping role, so there is a security element to the organization that is a little bit different than what you see with ASEAN. Uh, and what's interesting about ECOWAS is obviously it exists inside of uh, the African Union, which is often the organization that we think of and talk about when we discuss the continent of Africa. Uh, but you have several of these smaller economic uh, and security-based alliances within Africa that get an even more homogenous group of countries together. So ECOWAS has developed about 40 years ago, actually 1975, a little more than 40 years ago now, but what's interesting is when you look at the power structure of ECOWAS and when you look at all of these regional organizations, they tend to have the same issues as NATO. Let me show you what I mean by that. You really have a top tier and a bottom tier of countries. And so within ECOWAS, you can see your top tier countries are uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and Ivory Coast. These are countries with a significantly uh, larger population, particularly Nigeria, but more importantly, a significantly higher GDP because of that. And then you have your lower tier states, your Togos, your Nigers, your Gambias, that have very minimal GDP and much smaller population, uh, and obviously per capita GDP that is much, much lower as well. So when you are confronted with this, again, many times, just like in the EU, just like in NATO, you end up with two or three major player member states that really guide this discussion and drown out some of the voices uh, on the lower end of the economic spectrum. And so in ECOWAS, really it is Nigeria and Ghana and the Ivory Coast that are driving a lot of the decision making, whereas the smaller countries and the lower tier countries are simply not. So how does all of this regional alliance relate to the current pandemic uh, that COVID-19 has presented to us? Well, a couple of things. Uh, what's interesting is that despite this being a global pandemic that is spread across all of the regions of the world, regional organizations have been somewhat ineffective uh, as what you've seen is individual member states have decided to take individual action. And this is again what I said when you put a lot of pressure on these regional organizations during a time of crisis. Suddenly they don't want to do things as a collective anymore. They would rather do things individually. Germany's going to look out for Germany. Italy's going to look out for Italy. The United Kingdom's going to look out for the United Kingdom. Nigeria's going to look out for Nigeria. The United States is going to look out for the United States becomes very individualistic. It becomes very Lord of the Flies, if any of you read that book in grade school. It becomes very, very uh, Hobbesian to some extent. 
uh, nasty, brutish, and short. It, it can be quite, uh, uh, quite something to see, and we're seeing it in real time. So within the European Union, it's quite fascinating to see how this is really playing out in real time. So one of my best friends from graduate school is a professor at a university over in Sweden, and it is amazing to talk to him. On, I talk to him almost every day. It's amazing to hear the stories from Sweden. They're doing almost nothing. They've not closed any of their borders. All of their schools are still open. They absolutely very little has changed in their country. Uh, you know, people are still going out to the grocery store regularly. There's not a run on any products. There's no current crisis. Like I said, none of the borders have been closed. No major steps have been taken in the same way that they have in other countries. Sweden, amazingly, has actually not really been impacted by COVID-19 that much. Uh, they've, I think yesterday, uh, my friend said there were only 70 overall cases reported in the country, 69 of which were in Stockholm. So it's something that does appear to not have reached Sweden in some way. So you see the Swedes reacting one way quite differently. Uh, what's fascinating is even the other Scandinavian countries have taken much more stringent action. Uh, so it's not a Scandinavia thing as much as it's just a specifically a Sweden thing. Italy, on the other hand, is under complete lockdown. Uh, I'm in touch with my family over there on a pretty regular basis now, uh, and it is a scary situation. And obviously, we think maybe the worst has passed in the northern regions, but now we're starting to see an uptick in the southern regions. Uh, so it is something to, to keep an eye on over there, but that's a country that really went on complete lockdown. Uh, flights in and out really heavily sanctioned uh, and really forced people into their homes uh, in a way that you just didn't see uh, that was a little early on. Uh, and then Germany really getting ahead of the curve in terms of testing. So we're really doing a lot of preventative testing. Yes, there's shelter in place and yes, there are these other things that they're, they're doing that look similar to other states, but it really is a, a slightly different approach than what you're seeing other member states doing. Ultimately, what's fascinating about this is that the resources that are being shared um, by our government, uh, the resources that are being shared during this crisis are not really being shared by governments, but rather they're being shared by philanthrop uh, philanthropic organizations, people like Bill Gates, um, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, as well as corporations. Uh, individual corporations are stepping up and producing masks. You know, here in Austin, for instance, Tito's Vodka has agreed to uh, and has actually restructured their manufacturing uh, arm to start making hand sanitizing um, solution and is making 24 tons of hand sanitizing solution over the next a uh, couple of weeks. So you're seeing all these corporations kind of pivot very quickly and produce things for the public good in a way that governments are simply really looking after their own and not working collectively. It's quite fascinating to see. So moving forward, I would like for you to review the remaining material associated with this section. There's a couple of videos, there's or so one video, there's a few articles. Uh, as in addition to you, the, uh, the chapter in your textbook. Uh, I also want to make sure you complete your discussion assignment by this coming Sunday, April 5th. Uh, and then I want you to review the instructions for the country analysis paper. That paper has changed pretty significantly from what we went over in class. Okay, so review the new instructions. Your country assignment has remained the same but review uh, the information within that a little bit more carefully. I'm gonna be posting a video uh, to go along with those instructions just to talk you through some of those uh, changes as well. Uh, but the big thing, I want you to continue to stay safe out there. Reach out if you have issues, not just with accessing information, as I say here, but issues getting resources that you need in general for your life at this point. So stay safe. Be good, uh, and I look forward to checking in with you all later. Take care.